Okay, here we are for problem set 23. Um, and again, this is pretty heavy on integrals here. Um, this and the next one, and I think also problem set 25 are all pretty, pretty integral heavy. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So for the first one, we want to take the integral of this function on these bounds and uh, using that uh, fundamental theorem of calculus or fundamental property. I always forget exactly what it's called. Um, but when I have one of my bounds um, as a variable, my answer is just that variable plugged into this function, right? So I'm just going to plug in that x wherever I see a t. So it's going to end up being this. And that's it. The next one, though, is a little bit trickier. Um, just because we have both of our bounds are variables. So what ends up happening instead is that we essentially treat it like we're evaluating this integral on the bound. So I first plug in this to this function, and then I plug in this to this function, and I subtract them. Um, but it's worth noting that we also sort of have to apply chain rule uh, to this. So if we first take a look, I believe, oh, it is slipping my mind exactly how to go about this one. But I believe we plug in that x to the fourth, so it's going to be 2 plus x to the fourth to the fourth, which is x to the sixteenth to the one half, and then we uh, use that chain rule, so multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is going to be this, and then we subtract by doing the same, su subtract the same thing, but with that x squared, so it's going to be 2 plus x squared to the fourth, which is x to the eighth, to the one half, and then chain rule, so multiply by that inside. If I'm remembering correctly, we might also have to, uh, I'll have to double check my work for this one actually. Give me just a moment to figure, to refresh my memory. It's been a um, little, little more than half a week, I think, since I did this, because this was uh, available on Wednesday, and it is now Sunday, so I haven't touched it for about five days. Let's see. Okay. So I did this a little bit wrong. So we're going to backtrack. I found the actual definition written in my notebook, actually. Um, so when we are... Mm. Yes, because this is... I wrote this mistakenly. This isn't the... Um, just the integral. It's... Oh, right, 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 right. No. So f of x equals this integral. We are finding the derivative of f of x, which is why we can just plug in that x there. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is the same situation for number two. This is f of x. We are finding the derivative of that, um, which ends up canceling out this integral sign, but we still have to evaluate it on these bounds. Um, the reason that we don't care about this four is because obviously if we have um, any x value, Plugging in constants doesn't really make a difference, um, but because these are both variables, we end up needing to uh, plug that in. So what uh, it states is that the derivative of an integral with some variable or function on both bounds of some function or is then just going to be each uh, of those plugged in, just like I was saying, times the derivative of those bounds. And then do that subtraction. So that was a minor mistake that I made, but that changes it drastically, right? Um, so instead, it's going to be, say we still plug in that x to the fourth, but the derivative that we take for that little bit of chain rule is going to be that of this upper bound. So it's going to be 
4x cubed times this plugged into here, which is still this bit. Now minus that lower bound plugged in, so that derivative first is going to be 2x, and then plug it in times... And that's that. Continuing on, this one is just an integral. This one's not <laughs> taking the derivative of an integral. It's just evaluating this integral. Um, so this is obviously undoing that power rule. So this is what we have here. If I add one to that, if I, if I to undo that power rule, I'm going to add one to my exponent, which is going to get me this, right, because negative 5 thirds plus 3 thirds is negative 2 thirds, and then again, we always divide by the new exponent, so it had to be that. So what we've gotten is now whatever this is on these bounds. So now we just have to evaluate uh, those, those bounds there. So plugging in a 13 gets a little ugly. <laughs> um, well, so it's a negative 2 thirds. So I could also write it like this. Um, so then plugging in a 13 would be negative 3 over 2 times 13, this cube root of 13 squared. So I could write it like that. Um, and then subtract, plugging in that lower bound, which is going to cancel out that negative. 3 over 2, 2 squared is 4, so it's a cube root of 4, and that's sort of what we get. Not sure how to further reduce that right now. There might be a way to, but I won't lie, I'm a little, too, little bit too tired to fully process that right now. So I'm just going to leave it like this. Um, for plugging in something like this in the homework, I would recommend typing that into a calculator and plugging in uh, that numerical value. Uh, but I believe for this homework, most of it allows us to type it in with like fractions and things. Continuing on to number four, same deal, it's just a slightly different function. Uh, this time our variable is a y, but that doesn't change anything because we're still taking the integral with respect to y, as this dy tells us. So remember that this is the same thing as 2 times y to the negative third, this 2 just being some constant coefficient. So I'm really just undoing the power rule for this y to the negative third, which means I'm going to add 1 to that exponent, making it a negative 2. And I'm going to divide by negative 2. And then we've still got this coefficient in front. Those cancel out, so it becomes a negative y to the negative 2, or negative 1 over y squared. So that is our uh, indefinite integral. Obviously, if we were to just leave it there, we'd want to add that plus c. Uh, but we are given bounds to evaluate this on, so we now need to plug those in. So it's going to be 1 negative 1 over 16 minus a negative 1, so plus 1 over 9. That one's a little bit easier to simplify just because that's a easier common denominator to find. Let's think of what that least common multiple could be. Mm. If it's not any less than just multiplying them together, that's disappointing. Um, Hmm. Just checking with my calculator. Hmm. That's frustrating. Hold on. I want to try. Hmm. No, it is just, I was going to say I want to try the cake method, but that requires me to pull out common factors, and I don't see any, which means that we aren't going to get a common denominator short of multiplying them together. So that's going to be a negative 9 hundred forty-fourths plus 16 hundred forty-fourths, or just 7 hundred forty-fourths. Next up, we've got this here. So, of course, I know that the 
uh, derivative of e to the x is always e to the x, which means that the integral of e to the x is also going to be e to the power of x. Um, so we know that our integral is just this, but on these bounds. So then plugging those in, I'm going to get e to the power of natural log of 4 minus e to the power of 0. Well, I know that this cancels out, so it just becomes a 4 minus, and e to the power of 0 is 1, so it's 4 minus 1, which is just 3. Number 6 is a little bit different. This time we want to come up with an integral um, of this function on these bounds, and then we want to solve it because we've got this equal sign here. So of course we plug in our bounds, so we've got negative 2 up to 3. Remember we always want to write it um, from bottom to top, from our lowest number to our highest number, or least to greatest, <laughs> however you want to think about it. And then we just plug in our function. Don't forget to write which variable this integrals with respect to, which is that what that dx means. Okay, and now we have to solve it. Remember that 3 over x cubed is the same as 3 times x to the negative third. So just like we did up here, we're just going to undo that power. So we're going to add 1, and then we're going to divide by that power. So that becomes now negative 3 halves x to the power of negative 2, or negative 3 over x squared. And again, if we were to just leave this as it was, as an indefinite integral, we'd want to put that plus c and we could call it a day. Um, but this is a definite integral with bounds to evaluate it on, so we are going to evaluate it. So plugging in that 3, I'm going to get negative 3 over 2 times 9. And of course, that 3 and that 9 are going to cancel out, so it's going to turn into a 1 and a 3. Okay. Minus now a negative 3, so plus 3 over 2 times negative 2 squared, which negative 2 squared is 4. 2 times 4 is 8. So this turns into negative 1 sixth plus 3 eighths. Let's think of a common denominator. 24 should do. Okay, and so that should be that. Number seven uh, is another integral for us. Um, so it tells us that if our function f of x is this here, then the integral of f of x on these bounds equals what? Um, so first we have to take that general integral, that indefinite integral first, before we can evaluate it on those bounds. Um, looking at this, of course, I know that the um, sorry, and know that the derivative of cosine of x equals negative sine of x. So to have a positive sine of x, I know that the integral of this part is going to be a negative cosine of x. Off to a good start. And I know, let's see, this is cosine, negative cosine of x times cotangent of x. Well, I no, off the top of my head, just because I know my trig derivatives pretty well. I know that the derivative of um, cosecant x, I believe, is going to be a negative cosecant cotangent. If it were the derivative of cotangent, that would be a negative cosecant squared. So this is exactly what we have there. So taking the integral, we're just going backwards. So this is a positive cosecant of x minus a cosine of x. So this is going to be and then we want to evaluate it on these bounds. Remember that oops, remembering that cosecant is the same as 1 over sine. So plugging in that first thing though, it's going to be put plugging in our upper bound, we're going to get 1 over 
sine of pi over 2, which is just 1 over 1, so that's 1, minus cosine of pi over 2, so that's 1 minus 0 for plugging that first bound. And now we're going to subtract plugging in our lower bound. So now it's going to be 1 over sine of pi over 3. I know that sine of pi over 3 is going to be square root of 3 over 2. 1 over that is going to be 2 over square root of 3. We tend to like rationalizing, so I'm going to do that here. So it's going to be this. Not always necessary, of course, but good habit to be in. I often skip out on it. And then minus cosine of pi over 3. Cosine of pi over 3 is going to be 1 half. So this turns into, oops, let me erase this. So this turns into 1 minus this plus this. Notice how this negative turned into a plus because of, we're distributing that negative there. Don't forget that. That's a real easy way to lose your negatives, um, which makes this, I could rewrite that as a 1 and a half by combining like terms. So 1 and a half minus this. And I could find a common denominator and combine that fraction, but it doesn't really get much less messier than this, so I'm just going to leave it like that. And then finally, number 8 says if our function f of t equals 20 sine of t minus 1 on this interval, what is the mean value of f of x? Remember um, that our mean value theorem uh, looks something like this. So an integral from a to b of f of x oops, equals the mean value times b minus a. A lot of us also might know this as 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of our function equals the mean value which is, of course, just dividing both sides by this part right here. It's the exact same thing. Um, this is the way I learned it in high school, but, of course, there is no difference here. So whatever way you remember it the best is perfectly fine. Um, so we're looking for this function, or we're looking for this value, f of c. Um, so first, we know that our a is going to be 0, our b is going to be pi, our function we know is this. And then I'm going to go ahead and do this part here. So it's going to be pi minus zero, which is just pi. And all of that is going to equal this one value we're looking for. So we just take that integral and evaluate it, essentially. Um, so I know that the integral of sine of t is going to be negative cosine of, c, uh, cosine of t. So it's going to be 1 over pi times... Well, it's going to be negative 20 cosine of t, and I know the integral of negative 1 is going to be negative t on these bounds, which is then 1 over pi, plugging in a pi here. I know cosine of pi is negative 1, so negative 1 times negative 20 is just 20, and then it's 20 minus pi and then subtract by plugging in our lower bounds. I know cosine of 0 is 1. 1 minus negative 20 is negative 20 still. And then minus 0. So that gets to be 1 over pi. 20 minus pi minus a negative 20 turns into a plus 20, and that 0 disappears. So this gets to be 1 over pi times 40 minus pi which is then if I distribute this here, that gets to be 40 over pi minus one. Um, and I'm just gonna leave it like that. So our mean value, of course, is this here. So f of c, that mean value of the function, is what we just found, 40 over pi minus one. And that's it, that's all there is for this homework. Um, yeah, a lot of integrals.
Um, I know that they can be pretty tricky sometimes, especially the trig ones. They just really rely on you knowing your trig derivatives really well. Um, so I really recommend maybe flashcards for something like that. Um, on top of just a lot of practice, really, because I only know them as well as I do because I've done a lot of practice with them. Um, but yeah, so this problem set is all done. I hope that all of this made sense and thank you for watching.